Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Kunganesha Ministries. This week, we have been looking at Luke chapter 21. So we're going to go through the verses and run some commentaries on them as well. First of all, we start off with 1 to 4, the widow's offering. And it says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more money than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. So in our last passage in Luke 20, verses 45 to 47, we read about Jesus' warning about the teachers of the law. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. So now as we're starting to look at Luke 21, we see that Jesus is observing the rich offering their gifts to the temple treasury. Is this what prompted Jesus' warnings of the teachers of the law, as we saw in the previous chapter? But the point seems to be drummed home that the rich gave out of their wealth, so it wasn't much of a sacrifice for them. Let us bear in mind that Jesus is heading towards his crucifixion. He knows this and it would be quite understandable if his mind was fully fixed on that. But we see that he still takes the time to observe the widow putting in two small copper coins into the temple treasury. And this was done out of her poverty. For this widow, it was a major sacrifice. Let us take great comfort from the fact that Jesus notices this. He notices the things that we do, which might seem to others an insignificant act, but to, to us, they are great sacrifices. He knows what is done from the heart. He sees and understands all that we do. The rich would have made a great show of the amount of money they had contributed, but it wasn't done out of it, out of a love for God. It was done out of a love for the high, for high social standing to raise their stand, the status in society. The widow's offering was a great sacrifice, but sacrifices don't have to be solely financial. Our time can also be sacrificed, and we can do this through the time we take to preach and teach the Word of God. We can also offer our time in what we do for others, showing God's love and amazing grace. Now we look at verses 5 to 19. It's so quite a long one. Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. Some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on the other. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen, and they must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. 
and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on the account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to, to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. One of the things I view with awe is football stadiums. I'm fascinated by the structure and design. I shouldn't really admire these stadiums, firstly because of the exorbitant amounts of money that goes into creating them. Plus, they represent a sport that is flooded with greed at the top end. God has created something far more awesome than these stadiums that bring this world and the universe, <coughs> sorry, that be in this world and the universe, uh, that, we, <coughs> that this is where my admiration and worship should be focused. These all stadiums also have something in common with our passage today. Like the temple, one day not one stone will be left on another. Through decay, destruction, or so-called progress, these stadiums will one day be raised to the ground. Jesus' prediction that the temple could be destroyed came true in AD 70, when both the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed by the oppressors of the Jewish people, the Romans. Some of the signs we read that Jesus warned about would have taken place before the destruction of the temple and many of these will take place before his second coming. We see false prophets and false messiahs even today, people teaching me messages that stray far from biblical truths, and occult leaders proclaiming they are the way to heaven. Today, we see many wars, earthquakes, and much persecution, particularly on Christians proclaiming Christ in certain areas of the world. Does this mean that the second coming is near? We don't know. Nobody knows the day or date Jesus will return. Wars, earthquakes and persecution form much of the world's history. And still we wait. Jesus will return, but we just don't know when. Many people will ask, why does, why does God allow suffering? Perhaps we should ask, what does the world look like without any suffering? A world without suffering would be heaven. Revelations 21 verses 3 to 4 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He <clears throat> He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. So if we want our places alongside God in his dwelling place, we must seek him, him through his son, Jesus Christ. We must stand up firm in Jesus, proclaiming his message of love and salvation. We need not fear what we shall say because Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, will give us these words. We will endure the suffering and persecution because we see in verse 18 of this passage that not a hair of our heads will perish. One day we will be with our Father in all his glory. Verses 20 to 24. <clears throat> Jesus foretells the destruction of Jerusalem. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For well, this is a time of punishment in fulfilment of all that, was being, that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers 
there will be great distress in the land and wrath against the people. They will, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on, the Gentile, on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. The prophecy of the destruction of the temple is mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, but it is only that here in Luke that Jerusalem is mentioned as being destroyed. Luke probably had the benefit of being the last to write his Gospels, which was written approximately in AD 85, uh, sorry, AD 85, some 15 years after the destruction of the temple, and Jerusalem, uh, sorry, 15 years after the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem by the Romans. So he relates Jesus' prophecies to the destruction on the city as a whole. Jesus sets about advising that the folks of the city and all of Judea should flee to the mountains. The state of Israel ceased to exist upon the Romans' destruction of Jerusalem, and the nation was only reformed again in 1948, which Britain played a major role in restoring. In the meantime, the Jews had fled to many parts of the world, including Europe, and we know the sufferings and persecution of the Jews which took place upon them by Nazi Germany during World War II through what was known as the Holocaust. Jesus' prophecy came true. So how can we view this spiritually? Can we take a message from this passage today? As believers in Christ, we are children of God. As the Jewish white race have been known as God's people throughout scripture, today we Christians are his chosen people. And yet, little has, and yet, like, and yet, like has happened to the Jews, we know that much of what we hold dear can be destroyed. We aren't exempt from hard times, loss, and persecution, and the bad things in life may affect us personally in much the same way as the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem affected the Jews. And this may very well entail a restructuring of our lives and moving on from what we have known in order to progress our future and our fortunes. And it may seem that God is distant at this time, <clears throat> but he doesn't leave us. He carries us and he won't put us down until we have found solid, solid ground. And even then, he continues to journey with us, which is a very comforting thought. 25 to 33 the coming of the son of man and the lesson of the fig tree there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars on the earth nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea people will faint from terror apprehensive of what is to come on the world where the heavenly bodies will be shaken at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these hang things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So Jesus continued with the warning signs to come. There will be signs in the heavens and the nations will be in anguish at the roaring and the tossing of the sea and there will be much terror. Have we seen these signs already? We have global warming, earthquake and tsunamis, which seem to be reported on a more frequent basis. There is the scorching heat of the sun, which is making global average temperatures rise to dangerous levels. Polar ice caps are melting, causing sea levels to rise. Are these the signs? 
Jesus told a parable about the fig tree. Parables are normally considered to be a story with a moral message, but here Jesus uses the fig tree as an example. When the leaves start to sprout, we know that the summertime is near. So when we see the warning signs from heaven, we know that the second coming is drawing near. Verse 32 tells us that this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. How do we interpret that? There have been many generations in, in terms of the word generations as we know it. And that, that have passed away since Jesus spoke these words. But perhaps the word generations can, can mean the time, of, the, the time of man. Human life will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. As we've said before, we don't know when the time of the second coming will be here. Things, will happen to, things that happen today can seem very much like the warning signs that Jesus, that Jesus had prophesied. And likewise, we can perhaps interpret the world's tribulations today as the visions of David and the Apostle, Apostle John in the book of Revelations. Whatever the timing of Jesus' return, we must remain patient and we must remain prepared. If we do, then we have nothing to fear. And finally, we have verses 34 to 38. Watch yourself. Be careful of your hearts. <laughs> Sorry, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always aware, always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. So what do our hearts yearn for? Is it money, fame, power? What do we turn to when life gets difficult? Do we turn to alcohol or drugs? The world is full of trappings and these can come upon us quickly. See how within less than a year, the world has plunged into financial turmoil. Many seek ways of overcoming the pressures of life. And this may well be through substances that blot out reality, even if that, real, uh, even if that is only for a little while. But the need to be removed from reality grows stronger. And before you know it, you are in the grips of addiction. Or to overcome the financial struggles, some might revert to exploiting people, scamming and thieving. Life traps us and there seems to be no way out. Or is there? Rather than our hearts being focused on our trials and tribulations, they need to be focused on Jesus. In such difficult times, it is perhaps hard to have faith that doesn't doubt. A faith that is strong even through even though there appears to be no obvious answer to our dilemmas. Hebrews eleven verse one says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We can't see the end, but we must believe that in Jesus all will be well. I know that my faith is often stretched and anxiety creeps in, particularly when finances have all gone but I still have a family to feed. But we must turn to Jesus. Instead of scamming and thieving, let's turn to our Lord and Saviour. Through the Holy Spirit, he walks alongside us and we must be, must be faithful to him, even when the world seems to have more attractive and instant solutions. We know that one day he will return and he will turn again, and when he does, let him recognise us as having been obedient to him, having been prepared for his return. Jesus was a great teacher, and many people came to hear his words. His message 
is still relevant today and many people still have not heard his message. One of the ways of being obedient to him is to spread the message of love and salvation that he taught and we should preach this to all nations. Let us pray. Dear Father, you are an amazing God. We know that when there appears to be no way, you make a way. Help us to lean on you through your Son Jesus Christ during our struggles and help our faith to remain strong and to grow stronger. We ask this in the mighty name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>